This hour of local news is made possible by contributions from the friends of PBS, members of your PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to this special election 2022 edition of Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. Tonight, it's a debate sponsored by Clean Elections, your source for nonpartisan official election information. Tonight's debate features the two candidates running for state superintendent of public instruction, which oversees Arizona's public school system and the state's Department of Education. I'm Richard Grellis of the Arizona Republic and azcentral.com. Tonight's debate is not a formal exercise. It's an open exchange of ideas, an opportunity for give and take between these two candidates who are vying for one of the state's most important offices. Dialogue between the candidates is encouraged, provided that both sides get a fair shake, and we'll do our best to ensure that happens. The candidates will give opening statements in a randomly selected order, and later will give closing statements in the opposite order. And joining us now for tonight's debate in alphabetical order, Democrat Kathy Hoffman, the current superintendent of public instruction, and Tom Horn, a former superintendent of public instruction. He's also a former state attorney general and a former state lawmaker. Let's get things started with opening statements, and we begin with Tom Horn. Thank you, Ted. When I completed eight years the first time I was superintendent, Arizona proficiency rates were over 60% for math and over 70% for reading. Under Kathy Hoffman, even before COVID, those rates were 42% and 42%, a great drop. My heroes are math teachers who love math, history teachers who love history, and so on. A number of them have complained to me. They want to teach their academics bell to bell, but they can't do it because under Kathy Hoffman's uh, social emotional learning, they have to play dumb games with the kids, and that is a distraction from academics. We need to have discipline in our classroom, but under social and emotional learning, teachers are told not to discipline kids because it might hurt their feelings. I hope that I will have a chance in this debate to tell you what I will do to raise Arizona's test scores so that you can make an informed decision of which of us is more qualified to improve Arizona academics. Thank you. And now we turn to Kathy Hoffman. Good evening. I'm Kathy Hoffman, Arizona Superintendent of Public Instruction. When I was elected in 2018, it was the first time in over 20 years that an educator has been elected to lead Arizona's Department of Education. I started my career as a preschool teacher, then worked as a speech language pathologist, first in the Vail School District in Tucson, and then in the Peoria Unified School District. Over the past four years, I've traveled the state visiting hundreds of schools in all 15 counties, giving me the opportunity to hear directly from our teachers, our students, and families across the state. This is not a political stepping stone for me. As a mom and as an educator, I'm committed to ensuring that all students can achieve their full potential. All right, candidates, thank you very much. Let's get things started. Superintendent, we'll start with you. The latest test results, uh, the numbers are up, but not by much. And uh, most Arizona students failed reading and math. What's going on with that? Well, I want to be absolutely clear that we have our work cut out from us. After first struggling through the recession under uh, Mr. Horn's watch, Arizona cut more from public education than any other state in the country. Then with the COVID-19 pandemic, we saw nationally that under the, on the examination, the National Assessment of Educational Progress, or the NAEP, we saw nationally more, a uh, more significant decline in reading and math over the past year than over the past 30 years in history, but yet Arizona actually did make some growth across de all demographics, across income levels. Arizona actually is moving in the right direction, and that's because of the hard work of our teachers and educators and our families working together to make sure that kids are moving forward and making progress. Tom, are we moving in the right direction? Uh, definitely not. The biggest drop occurred not during COVID, but between my 60% and 70%, and the pre-COVID numbers of Kathy Hoffman of 42% and 42%. Uh, so, uh, and of course the numbers are getting even lower now. And one of the problems there is that the schools were kept closed too, uh, too much. Uh, uh, the governor wanted to use the CDC guidelines and leave it up to the, the districts for local conditions. Uh, Kathy Hoffman was quoted in the Republic with a big headline that said, close all the schools in the state. That was not good for students. It was certainly not good for their parents, some of whom had to give up their jobs 
we don't really know who that was good for, but it was bad for students. How did the, the, the COVID, uh, the pandemic in general and for education in particular, I mean, how much did that factor into test results and your ideas regarding keeping schools open, closing schools, children wearing masks, these sorts of things? Let's go back to March of 2020 when no one in the world could have imagined what was about to hit us, the, the COVID-19, the most unprecedented pandemic of our lifetimes. If I had known then what I know today, maybe some decision making would have been a little bit different, but during the, over the past two years, I never imagined that part of my job as state superintendent would be making phone calls to superintendents and principals, offering my condolences. For example, the, in the Hayden Winkleman School District, which is a very rural part of Arizona, they lost Mrs. Bird, a, first, a beloved first grade teacher to COVID-19. And so, of course, my focus was, and along with Governor Ducey, was how can we ensure that we're doing everything possible to keep our kids alive and safe and making sure that our schools are a healthy learning environment for everyone who is working in that environment. With what was known then in the early days of the pandemic, was it not a responsible thing to do to side on the to side of air on the side of caution, if you will? Well, a lot of um, private schools and charter schools stayed open throughout, um, and they didn't have serious any serious problems with the health of the kids. Kids are resistant to COVID as, as opposed to older people. Um, but even if it made sense to close them initially, they were kept closed far too long. And that had a very detrimental effect on their mental health, and that in turn had a detrimental effect on their physical you health. You mentioned kids and older adults. There are older adults in families and older adults in school, whether they're teachers or staff. I mean, there isn't, do you, you want them protected as well? Do you yeah, know? well, you know, I tried cases in court where they had a screen in front of the judge, and, and we tried the case and we were there and nobody got sick. In Arizona, we lost over 30,000 Arizonans lost their lives to COVID over the past several years. It's been been completely tragic, but during the pandemic, we we ensured that we were focusing on solving the issues to serve our students best. I'm really proud of our work. We launched the technology task force, partnering with the business community and philanthropy, creating the first of its kind office of digital teaching and learning in the department to make sure we're getting expanding internet to our rural communities and getting technology out to our students. We added over $21 million to add more mental health professionals to our schools, decreasing the student to school counselor ratio by 20%. That's that's making sure that kids are getting the services that they need when we know that their mental health is a top priority. We'll move on to a different topic and hopefully deal yeah. with this one fairly quickly. Uh, Tom, you've mentioned you have a campaign ad that criticizes your opponent for starting a, a Q chat space on right. the department website. Yes. You call it a sexual predator's dream or your ad calls it a sexual predator's dream and said that she's pushing it on children. <laughs> Do you think this is an intentional act or something that she did in your by error, you no, know. No, I'm not alleging it's intentional, but I think it's very harmful. I, I stand for empowering parents. Uh, uh, QChat stands for Queer Chat, believe it or not, and it's on the official Department of Education website. Kids can go on there without their parents' permission. They give detailed information about themselves. They give detailed information about their sex sex lives or, or sexual thoughts, and um, and then they talk to. Q chatters who are volunteers from around the country who are not licensed professionals. We don't know how many I, of them. And I need to jump well, in here with some clarification that Q chat is recommended by the CDC and the National Organization Mental Health for America as a resource for ser helping to support our LGBTQ youth. Um, what I think is more deeply concerning to Arizonans is that Mr. Horn has been soliciting work from David Stringer on his campaign, and and we know from um, David Stringer's record that he made publicly made racist comments about Arizona children, along with his history of being accused used for um, having sex with, for paying minors for sex. So it's deeply disturbing for Arizonans. So I think these attacks on the LGBTQ community are strictly political and, and... And we'll let you respond to David Stringer, but briefly, how did the idea for the Q chat come up? Was it your idea? Did it go through the board? And what was the original intent? I'm glad you asked. We actually work with a committee of um, 
parents, students from the LGBTQ community, and educators. And that we created a, a portion of our website that is dedicated to resources for LGBTQ students, parents, and educators. And again, this is a group of students who far too often are facing hate in the world and, and, and communication out there that's attacking our LGBTQ youth. So the intention behind having this, this is a resource, again, recommended by the CDC that is meant to support our students. So this, these, are t these attacks are political and baseless. The LGBT could, could I just explain, because when I was interrupted in the middle of talking about queer chat, uh, the, uh, they talk to queer chatters that are not licensed professionals. Um, we don't know how many of them might be predators. If that website is ever hacked, it, we know it'll be sold on the dark web, web to predators there. Um, parents have no, have no role to play. In fact, there's an escape button so that if a parent comes and he starts to see what's on the computer, the kid can push the escape button and, and it looks like they're talking what about... Ad what advice would you give to a student who's struggling with their gender identity or their sexual orientation and is afraid to speak to their parents about no, it? No, they should, they should talk with, uh, the, with trained, licensed counselors in the schools. I'm in favor of a counselor in every school. But, uh, but this is, I think, outrageous to have the parents not play any role. They, they're, they don't know that the kids are, are engaging in this cute chat with these adults. Um, and I have a message for the parents and grandparents out there. If you're comfortable having your child talk with a stranger about sexual matters without your participation, please vote for Kathy Hoffman. If you're not comfortable with that, please vote for Tom Horn. I, I'm for empowering parents and working on getting up our test scores and working on academics. Please respond to that. Well, I think empowering parents is building strong relationships between parents and teachers. I'm a mom. My daughter will be starting preschool in just a few short years. What I'm focused on is not these culture wars attacking LGBTQ youth. I am focused on the issues that Arizona families really care about. Families like mine that's thinking about why is our state not funding preschool? Why do we still not have full day kindergarten? If we want our state to be moving forward, let's be supporting public education, including making our schools safe and inclusive for all kids including our LGBTQ youth. And let, me say, let me just say, real I'm, quickly, I, I'm also a father and a grandfather, and I don't think kids should be talking with uh, unlicensed professionals with the parents not knowing about okay, it. Okay, the David Stringer situation, why would you have someone like that even remotely involved with your campaign? The, the only association he had with the campaign was that he made a contribution, which I ultimately returned, and that was it. He there was, was a photograph of, of you with him, and it sounded as though he was part of your campaign not or helped of, you with your campaign. It was not a photograph of me with him. It was a photograph of him with some signs that were put up. That was part of his uh, contribution in kind, but he is not part of my campaign. The campaign is based in Phoenix. He's a lawyer up in Prescott. His only association with the campaign was that he made a contribution in kind, which I ultimately returned, and that's it. But you defended him. You defended him originally, saying that the charges were false and that you, you stuck by him, and then all of a sudden you didn't stick by. What all, changed? All he did was make a contribution in kind. Ted, let me ask you this. Can we talk about education policy? Because I want it, I think the people out there would like we, to know. Yes, and as, we, we, as are, a, we are going to. Okay, but we as, need opposed, for you to as opposed to a personal attack, somebody make a, a campaign. This is not a, a personal campaign. attack when it's somebody on your record. Somebody making a campaign contribution to me mm -hmm. and it's being returned does no harm to anybody. Q chat, queer chat, does a lot of harm to kids who are on there without their parents knowing about it and who knows what predators they're Should you have been aware to. of that donation, that in-kind donation? Should you have been aware of it? Yes, and I ultimately returned it. And the, let's be meaning, clear, meaning it, was it was an in-kind donation. It was you re, you, you it, repaid him in cash. Uh, yeah, I paid in cash for the cost to him of putting some signs up. That was it. Can we talk about education no, let's policy? No, let's be clear about this issue, that the day after the primary election, the very first person you thanked on Twitter was David Stringer, who had made publicly racist comments about Arizona children and had been accused of crimes paying minors for sex. That, that is horrific. I know in, under my leadership, I would never associate with anyone like that. I would not, never solicit them to put up a sign. I would never ask them to spend any money towards my campaign. You know, I can, it's, I can it's a matter of a lack of judgment, and we want to make sure the person in, who is leading the Department of Education understands the difference between right and wrong. I Last can point. see that Kathy Hoffman does not want to talk about education policy. I want to talk about how are we going to get our test scores up? Let's talk and about teachers. Let's yes. talk about teachers okay, and the teacher shortage. Will you give me a to talk about how we get the test scores? We'll give you a chance to talk about whatever okay. you want to talk about, provided there's time permitting. Let's talk okay. about teachers right now and the yes. teacher shortage in Arizona. Yes. Why is there a teacher shortage in Arizona, and what would you do about it? Well, I think there are two things to do about the teacher shortage. Interestingly, teachers, when they leave the profession, they're surveyed. And the number one reason they give for, not, for leaving is not salary. 
its failure to have support from the administration, especially on discipline. Um, and I would emphasize that we have to have administrators support our teachers on discipline. We have to have orderly classroom, otherwise the kids can't learn. In my school district, I served 24 years on the school board. We didn't reverse a teacher one time on discipline, not one time. Uh, we were known as the toughest district around. Our learning came up, our test scores came up. Under Kathy Hoffman's social emotional learning, they discouraged discipline. And so that's the number one. Number two, we have to pay our teachers more, which means we have to cut back on administration. I've been a long crusader against excessive administrative costs. We have to pay our teachers more so we're competitive. We're losing teachers to all our surrounding states. Number one, discipline. Number two, teacher pay. For me, the number one priority is that our teachers deserve competitive pay. For far too long, Arizona average teacher pay has been at the bottom. But we're also, we, under my administration, we've also been looking for innovative ways to strengthen the teacher pipeline and make sure we're supporting teachers who are already in the classroom. So number one, we created the Arizona Teacher Residency Program in partnership with NAU to create a new pipeline to recruit teachers. Second, we've been investing heavily millions of dollars in teacher mentoring, especially for our new teachers who are, who are new to our classrooms, we want to make sure they feel supported and have can lean on the expert of other master teachers. Um, alternative pathways to make teachers uh, who have knowledge but who don't have to go to education school actually started in my administration. That was my in innovation. The legislature passed or expanded um, education empowerment, empowerment scholarship accounts. Now I've gotten the nomenclature right. Mm -hmm. How big can this program get? Do you support it? I do not support expansion of the ESA voucher program simply because I do not believe that anyone should be profiting off of our education, off, off, off of our public education tax dollars. I think public education dollars should stay in public education. There is no accountability for our students who are enrolled in, in the ESA voucher program. Let me give you a quick example and, and also want to point out that in, anyone on this stage could open a private school, a, a, a religious or even a political private school, but then I was recently up in Snowflake, Arizona, where community members reached out to me with concern because there had been a private school specifically advertised for children with autism, and all of the tuition was paid using ESA vouchers. So the, the owner of this private school for kids with autism, they made a lot of profit, and then without warning to any families, they shut down the school, leaving the families high and dry, seeking alternative education options for their kids with autism. And so it's those types of schools where we have no accountability and we and I think we really need to prioritize on fully funding our public education system. Is there enough oversight in the ESA program? I support the ESA program. Uh, rich people can send their kids to any school they want to. Poor people should have that ability as well. And the whole idea of the ESA program is to give the people who don't have as much money the ability to do the same thing that rich people do now, which is to send their kids to any private school they want to. We're, we're running short of time. Can I talk well, about... Th though the initial statistics show that most of the people who are, 75% of the people who've applied for the account right. already have their child in a private school. That's what the initial statistics show. We'll have to see what happens. And if I'm elected and I serve in office, I'll watch carefully what happens. And if there are tweaks needed to the system, I'll propose Would you consider them. a cap then, an income cap? Uh, I'm, I'm not considering anything right now except uh, except enforcing. Not right the, now, but would you consider that? If it's if it three quarters of the people are already sending their kids to private school, yeah. then the poor people that you were talking about, the lower income people, if you right. will, they're not getting this. Right now, my, my dedication is to enforce the bill that was passed by the legislature, which is the job of the superintendent of schools, um, and then to keep an eye on it. And if I think it needs tweaks, I'll support it. To enforce it, but not necessarily support it. Uh, I do support it. I explain the reason why. It, 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 it equalizes things for poor people with rich people. Um, what is critical race theory? What is it? Where is it taught? Why are you so concerned about you it? You asked me that question during the primary, and, and I'll give you the same answer I gave then. Critical race theory is the opposite of what I believe and what I believe is the American ideal. And that is that we're all individuals. We're all brothers and sisters under the skin. We're entitled to be judged as individuals, and race is irrelevant. In critical race theory, they teach kids that race is primary. And when I fought that in Tucson when I was in office, they actually divided the kids by race. Whites in one, classroom one, blacks in classroom two, Hispanics in classroom three, Native Americans in classroom four. And they, and they created tension between groups, be, uh, saying that some people are oppressors and others are oppressed. Kids are not oppressors or oppressed, and they shouldn't be told that some of them are oppressors and some of them are oppressed. Is that kind of thing going on, and should it be going on? 
I think this is just classic from Mr. Horn, just just as it was an issue back when they um, when he advocated for the ban in Tucson. This is an attack on our public school system. I, I strongly believe our students should be taught an accurate history, and they should also be learning empathy and learning to, to be critical thinkers when they're reading the historical context. Um, that the text should also be culturally relevant. But you know, after the ban on Mexican American studies was implemented, that was a lengthy seven-year lawsuit that cost our state a lot of money, and the judge ultimately ruled it, that it was unconstitutional because it was racially and politically motivated. So that's exactly what I'm hearing again here today from Mr. Horn, is something that's racially and politically motivated that's meant to create distrust between families and our public schools. I believe in the exact opposite of racially uh, motivated things. I believe we're all individuals and race doesn't count for anything. And the question about whether it exists now, it's all over the state right now, and I'll give you the evidence. Uh, I have a list of 200 teachers, Arizona teachers, that at the uh, National Education Association signed a statement that if the state banned critical race theory, they would defy it. They wouldn't be doing that unless they were already teaching it, and they come from the, our 25 largest school districts, which means it's taught in every one of our 25 largest school districts, and they're teaching kids that race is the most important thing about them, and I say no, race is not important. What's important is individuality, what person knows, what he can do, what is the character, what is the ability to appreciate uh, uh, beauty. How should the struggles of African Americans in this country be taught in should schools? Should be taught accurately, and, and I'm all for teaching the horrors of slavery and Jim Crow and uh, what happened in Oklahoma and How all that. How does that not cross the bounds into critical race theory then? What's, no, it absolutely does not. No, How? that's a that's a myth. It does not cross, no. People should be taught accurate history, but they shouldn't be taught that kids are oppressors or oppressed based on what race they were born into. They shouldn't be divided by race. They shouldn't be taught that the race is the most important thing about them. The history should be taught accurately, but they, they need to be taught, and, and I brought a uh, a program of, of prejudice reduction into the school district where I served 24 years on the school board to teach kids treat each other with dignity and individuality and don't pay attention okay. to race or sex. Does that make sense to you? Well, to me it doesn't make sense that this is Mr. Horn's number one priority. CRT is not the number one issue facing public education today. I'm focused on our educator recruitment and retention. I'm focused on the mental health and well-being of our students, keeping our, I mean, we haven't even had a chance to touch on school safety yet. That's a huge priority for me as well, one of my number one concern. And we, we have a, a lot to be focused on to make sure our schools are the best they can be for all students, and I don't think that CRT is at the top of that list. But you haven't been focused on academics at all. That, that, was, that, was, that was my next question. We've only got a couple minutes left. Campus, we do you want to talk about security? school safety? After okay. the Uvalde shooting, there's been worries about how we keep our campuses safe. What is the answer? Uh, officers, uh, arming teachers, what is, what is, how do we keep our kids safe? Let me start by saying this is not a new issue with Uvalde. This goes back years. I mean, I even think about watching on the news when Sandy Hook happened, when the massacre of children in Sandy Hook School. I think about Parkland. As a mom and as an educator, these events are horrifying and terrifying. I worry about the safely being able to send my daughter to school. And so we do need to make this our number one priority because every parent, every family member should be feeling safe sending their kid to school. After Parkland, at the beginning of my administration in 2019, I launched the School Safety Task Force, and that worked, that produced resources for schools, including a model school safety plan. And also since 2019, I've grown the School Safety Grant Program from a $12 million program to now an $80 million program, which has, again, reduced this, the student to school counselor ratio by 20%. And it gives local control, local communities, the decision making on if what type of school safety position they would prefer. As a Dad and a granddad, I want people to be protected in case a, mani a maniac comes into an Arizona school. The way, if they can do it in Texas, they can do it here. The legislature had a bill to double the funding for police in the schools. I am in favor of a policeman in every school. Uh, Kathy Hoffman sent out a Twitter saying she was opposed to it because prejudice does not stop at the schoolhouse door, implying that our police are prejudiced, which is a little bit cuckoo. Uh, we need to have a policeman in every school. And when, when I've made proposals like this, we've had Democrats in the, in the legislature say, we want our schools to be gun free. That's saying, come get us, we're victims. There's no one to, to defend us. We need a policeman in every school to defend our kids and our grandkids. And we need to stop right there. My goodness, I wish we had more time here. Uh, let's get to closing statements and going in reverse order of our opening remarks. We start with Kathy Hoffman. 
I strongly believe that Arizona's future starts in our schools, and there's no reason for Arizona to look 20 years backwards in the rearview mirror to figure out what our students need now. From my travels around this state, I'm well informed on what our state needs to move forward. And I'm proud of my accomplishments over the past four years in strengthening the teacher pipeline by, for example, creating the first ever teacher residency program and investing in teacher mentoring programs. We've been able to reduce the student to school counselor ratio by 20%, adding hundreds of mental health professionals to our schools. We've worked in partnership with the business community to expand internet and add technology access for our students, even in the most rural parts of the state. Again, this is not a political stepping stone for me. And as I think about my daughter's future, I'm thinking about the, the future vision for all of our public schools, for all kids in Arizona, and we can move this work together, forward together. So I ask for your vote this November and can't wait for that second term. Thank you so much. And now the closing statement from Tom Horn. Well, as a dad and a granddad, it's hard for me to understand how anybody can be proud of a record where the, where the proficiency rates went down from 60% in math and 70% in reading to 42% in each of those uh, even before COVID. Um, and Kathy Hoffman has not wanted to talk about academic improvement, but I'll talk about it. What we need to do is the Department of Education needs to be a service organization. It needs to send out um, teams of specialists, school improvement specialists, to help schools do better. Under my administration, we did that. Kathy Hoffman did not do that. We need to hold districts accountable for low test scores. Um, and I, I would ha even scheduled hearings to, to take over s s districts that had low test scores. And just scheduling the hearings, they got the message and the test scores came up. Kathy Hoffman has done, not done any of that. We need to hold school, uh, teacher, uh, students accountable. In, under my administration, they had to pass a test to graduate, which was a good motivation for them. After I left, that was taken away. So when the teachers asked the kids to do well on the test, they said, why should I? And they would leave early. We need to do a lot of these okay. things to improve our test scores. I will do them. Kathy Hoffman did and that. That is your one minute for your closing statement, and good to have you both here. Thank you so much. Great conversation. Richard. A programming note, Arizona Horizon will host a, bit, a debate between the candidates running for Maricopa County attorney. That is tomorrow, Thursday, at 5 and 10 p.m. on Arizona Horizon and live streamed, of course, at azpbs.org. And you can watch this debate again on azpbs.org, where you can catch all of Arizona Horizon's past program. You can also watch our shows live via streaming on that same site. That is it for now. Thanks so much for joining us. You have a great evening. Kids will always be more curious. Arizona PBS delivers programs that serve as a trusted guide for little explorers. Thanks to you and... Elections are right around the corner, and with recent changes to many election laws, it's more important than ever to know how, when, and where to vote. 